The first speaker this morning is Professor Christoph Schwobel. He is currently the professor of systematic theology at the University of Tübingen. Uh, beginning next fall, he will be the chair of divinity at St. Andrews, replacing the late John Webster. Uh, I could spend uh, half the time in introducing Professor Schwobel. He's asked me to keep it short. So uh, I will keep it short by saying he's the author of six monographs, the editor of 20, 22 academic volumes, and published approximately 200 articles. Uh, along with his publications, he has also oh, served the church and academy in many capacities. Um, noteworthy among them is ecumenical work, not only uh, a founding member, member of the East-West Theological Forum, but also actively involved in Catholic Lutheran discussions for over a decade, uh, as well as influential in developing uh, Christian Muslim dialogue in the country of Germany. This morning, he will be lecturing on Wolf, Wolfhart Pannenberg. The topic of the uh, lecture is Nature, Contingency, and the Spirit, a conversation with Wolfhart Pannenberg. Please join me in wel welcoming Professor Christoph Schwobel. Jeffrey for a relatively short introduction <laughs> and um, thank you so much for inviting me. My thanks to the um, Institute. It's a great honor to be here and a pleasure. Nature Contingency and the Spirit, a conversation with Wolfhard Pannenberg. The engagement with the natural sciences, the findings, their theories and theory formation and their effect on our understanding of reality was an ongoing concern of Wolfhard Pannenberg's theology throughout his theological career. He himself dated the beginning of this conversation back to the 1950s and the talks between natural scientists, mainly physicists and theologians in Göttingen. These conversations were then continued at Heidelberg in a working group at the Research Academy of the Protestant Church in Germany. It was in this context that the paper Contingency and Natural Law was written in 1966, published in 1970, which shaped much of Pannenberg's later reflections on a the theology of nature. The theme of contingency, crucial for the understanding of God's action in history and central for Pannenberg's programmatic proposal presented in the collection of essays by the Pannenberg Circle with the title Revelation as History shows that the central questions of Pannenberg's engagement with the natural sciences are also those which are central to the development of his own theology. One can interpret the logic of the development of Pannenberg's theology as filling in the missing links of his conception of revelation as history. Pannenberg's engagement with the natural sciences parallels this continuous extension of the scope of his theology until he presented it in, his, in its finished form in his systematic theology. Wolfhard Pannenberg's theology is therefore one of the few examples of a theology, perhaps the only one in the 20th century, where all crucial steps towards the formation of his system were accompanied by a parallel engagement with the natural sciences their philosophical implications, and the questions they raise for philosophy and theology. From the beginning, Pannenberg aimed at conducting a theological conversation with the sciences, an endeavor quite different from the science and religion dialogues as they are conventionally perceived. Pannenberg is less concerned with offering an apology for religion which might be acceptable to scientists. He's inquiring in which way the natural sciences call for clarifications in the theological understanding of God and God's action in the world, and in which way theological reflection offers suggestions for the interpretation of the findings and theories of the natural sciences. Furthermore, for Pannenberg, philosophy was always the bridging discipline. One could almost say the simultaneous interpreter translating in both directions in the conversation with the sciences. This implies, on the one hand, that he attempts to make explicit 
the philosophical presuppositions and implications of scientific theories which in the sciences often remain implicit. On the other hand, he's also concerned to point to the philosophical implications of Christian beliefs, including the ways in which Christian faith calls for a conceptual revision of philosophical conceptions and redescriptions of scientific theories. The conversations between theology and the sciences, which are often conducted through philosophy as the interpreter, are in Pannenberg's work always traced back through their histories. The history of concept formation in theology, philosophy, and the sciences is the medium for Pannenberg's explorations. This often challenges received views of all three histories involved and points to new combinations between them, new possibilities opened up by the new interpretations that Pannenberg offers. In these attempt, recourse to the biblical witnesses is always the starting point for the analysis of the concept formation of Christian theology, often calling for revisions of its received conceptualities, and a permanent reference point for exploring the adequacy of philosophical concepts and scientific theories. In the following reflections, I shall briefly consider Pannenberg's understanding of nature, his understanding of contingency and its complex relations to necessity and possibility, and finally, his most innovative interpretation of the being and operation of the spirit as a field of force. It is precisely the achievement of Pannenberg in all three areas of investigation that offers the opportunity for raising a few questions that seem to me profitable to pursue in conversation with Pannenberg's thought. First section, understanding nature. From a theological perspective, it seems surprising that Pannenberg starts his engagement with the relationship between contingency and natural law with considerations of the possibility of a theology of nature. However, this starting point is programmatic. Pannenberg observes that in modernity, a rift has opened between theology and the knowledge of nature. For Christian faith, this chasm seems unacceptable if the God of Christian faith is also the Lord of nature. Pannenberg fears that in this context, marked by the development of the modern sciences, starting theological reflections from the concept of creation already accepts the separation of theology and the sciences by starting with a purely theological concept. Of course, he does not want to give up um, the understanding of creation. However, rather than serving as a starting point, it marks for him the possible result of a theology of nature, of a theological interpretation of natural reality. Furthermore, Pannenberg fears that the term creation might focus the discussion exclusively on the beginning of the cosmos. In contrast to that, a theology of nature would have to look at nature in the totality of its processes and try to relate them to the reality of God. Pannenberg does not deny that the development of the modern sciences is to a large part the history of the emancipation of the natural sciences from their theological presuppositions. He concedes the defeat of theological apologetics that, that have tried to place the action of God only in the gaps of the knowledge of nature and the sciences. Aubrey Moore's pithy observation that people who take refuge in gaps find themselves awkwardly placed once the gaps begin to close has been shown to be true on more than one occasion in the history of theological apologetics. Mm -hmm. However, it is, in Pannenberg's view, unsatisfactory to respond to the defeat of theological apologetics with a cautious attitude that attempts to develop a theology of creation exclusively on a theological plane that remains unassailable by the criticism of the sciences. This attempt, Pannenberg sees exemplified in Karl Barth's doctrine of creation in Church Dogmatics 3.1, which would make theology irrelevant, not only for the sciences, but also for all people whose understanding of reality is largely focused and formed by the sciences. 
In contrast, Punberg states that nature as it is investigated by the natural sciences should be claimed by a theology of creation. He equally rejects the attempt to reduce the doctrine of creation to the view that God has created me, making the subjective experience of creatureliness the beginning and end of a theological engagement with nature. Punberg is clear that the idea of God can no longer be developed on the basis of the knowledge of nature. For him, anthropology is the ground on which the function of the idea of God for the human understanding of reality must be analyzed, which consequently might possibly provide reasons for the justification of the idea of God. However, even if the idea of God cannot be developed on the basis of our knowledge of nature, it must nevertheless be shown to have validity for the whole of human experience of the self and the world. A God who is not the origin and consummator of the world of nature could not be the power that determines everything, and so could not be God. The constructive aim of his considerations is described by Pannenberg as the search for a common plane, gemeinsame Ebene, to which theological and scientific problems can be related without obscuring the difference between both forms of thought. Pannenberg develops his understanding of nature on the basis of what he calls the Israelite understanding of God who acts in events that happen contingently. On this view, only the future will show the full meaning everything that happens contingently has. Can this understanding of the contingency of events be constructively applied to the understanding of nature in the natural sciences? Prima facie, the very concept of a natural law seems to contradict this possibility, since it seems to establish a necessary connection between events A and B, if A then B, and so supports the deterministic view of nature in classical physics. <coughs> Pannenberg clearly sees that this kind of determinism would establish a realm of nature that would, in principle, not be accessible to God's action. A deistic God who establishes the laws of nature at the beginning and then takes early retirement seems to be the only way in which language of God can still function in this framework. Once an inner worldly necessity of natural laws is established, there is no relationship between God and nature. Pannenberg now attempts to create space for a view of God acting in and interacting with the world of nature in its particular events and in its general regularities. Therefore, he tries to show that the contingency of in individual events of their regularities and of the direction of the whole process of nature is the framework within which the regularities of the connections between particular event events as well as particular events themselves have to be understood. This view of contingency serves as the common plane to which scientific and theological statements must be related. The motivation of attempting to show that contingency is the framework for understanding nature can be justified by pointing to the indeterminacy of elementary events on the quantum level, instabilities which appear in chaotic processes, and the irreversibility of the course of time as it is stated in the second law of thermodynamics. Pannenberg does not question that the overwhelming majority of the sequences in the processes of nature are characterized by uniformities, which can be stated in the universal hypotheses of the sciences. However, Pannenberg insists these uniformities occur with regard to contingent sequences of events in which every single one, every single event is contingent so that each event is followed by a contingently new event. Because of the irreversibility of time, every event is a singularity and their sequence, which binds these different contingent events together, must have the form of a history. Contingency refers then to that which factually exists, but is not necessarily not. Not only that is contingent, that is, um, that is but is not necessarily 
everything that is not possible and could not be, although it is fact, fact sorry, I say that again, everything that is not impossible and could be not, although it factually is, is contingent. In other words, everything that is not impossible, i.e. that is not necessarily not and exists, although it could not exist, is contingent. What Pannenberg does with these conceptual maneuvers is that he breaks up the conceptual contradiction between contingency and necessity and um, makes a new relation between contingency um, and possibility. The realm of contingency comprises both that which is strictly singular and that which is uniformly governed by the so-called necessity of natural laws. Once this understanding of contingency is established, it becomes clear that contingency is the category which envelops both nature and history. In nature, it is, according to Pannenberg, the foundational term for singularities as well as for rule-governed uniformities. This understanding of nature is open for God's relationship to the world, both in the uniform regularities of nature and in the contingent events in nature. God's creative action maintains the regularities of the natural laws in order to provide the basis for the emergence of independent creatures. The natural laws are, on this view, strictly relative to God's creative agency. They are, one could say, consuetudines dei, habits of God the creator, as Leibniz put it. Once contingency is established as the framework for understanding both singularities and uniformities, Pannenberg can then proceed with developing his understanding of nature as history, developed mainly in conversation with Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker's classic Die Geschichte der Natur, published in 1948, The History of Nature. The notion of contingency has far-reaching implications for the understanding of the historical process of nature, both for theology and for the natural sciences. For Pannenberg, the assumption of a goal-directedness from the beginning which governs every event and so establishes continuity is incompatible with this notion of contingency since it would imply that every new event can be understood from its antecedent conditions. If there is to be continuity in contingency, it must be understood as a kind of backwards continuity, a retroactive continuity in which what happens later establishes the continuity with, uh, with that which happens earlier. If this continuity is to establish not only the continuity in different strands of events, but also to be seen as constitutive for the unity of everything that occurs in nature and history, it must be understood as the consummation of everything that occurs in God's perfecting agency. For Pannenberg, this is a distinctive Christian thought, since it is the basic conviction of Christian faith that the end of history, in his interpretation, has already, in advance, proleptically, as he, uh, is the term he uses, occurred in Jesus Christ and especially in Christ's resurrection. Pannenberg is doubtful whether the idea of the end as the completion of, it, completion of history, which is the basis for conceiving the unity of all processes in nature and history, can be abstracted from its theological roots. This idea, however, cannot be stated by theology in terms of what Pannenberg calls a pseudophysical rival theory, but must be stated as a theological view based on theological considerations. In the conversations with the natural sciences, it can only be used as a heuristic tool for exploring the question of the unity of all events and processes. A theology of nature is thus the theological presupposition of conceiving the unity of nature. Second section, reclaiming contingency, lessons from conceptual history. As we've seen, contingency is seen by Pannenberg as the basic category for the development of an understanding of nature that can serve as a mutual reference point both for the natural sciences and for Christian theology. The Aristotelian heritage of Christian theology had the effect, in his analysis, 
that contingency was predominantly associated with something material that is actual, but could possibly also be different. Contingent is that which does not essentially be belong to the concept, the nature of something, but can be assumed or received by it. The association of contingency with actual matter that could be different is then expanded in the Middle Ages, for example in Thomas Aquinas, to the contingent result of an act of choosing. Pannenberg, however, ascribes a re-evaluation of the concept of contingency to his philosophical and theological hero in the medieval period, John Duns Scotus, the subject of Pannenberg's doctoral dissertation. Only a freely acting cause can effect something contingent, because everything that effects something out of the necessity of its nature, the Aristotelian Thomistic view, can logically not cause something that could also be different. The first cause of everything effects something contingent, not out of the necessity of its nature, but by the freedom of its will. However, if God is immutable, how can the effect um, be of his action be something contingent? Hans Goethe's answer is that a created will can only choose contradictory things in successive acts. That is due to the imperfection of created agencies. The eternal will of God, however, comprises all contents of his choosing in one eternal immutable act, even if these aims of God's willing are actually actualized at different times and in different places in the created world. Pannenberg observes that this re-evaluation of contingency is due to a different understanding of possibility. The possibility of whatever is precedes um, its actualization in the divine intellect. This possibility is the presupposition of God's choice, and whatever God chooses to actualize is then contingently actual. Contingently is therefore no longer related to the indeterminacy of matter, as in Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, but in the freedom of God whose free will is the ground of everything that exists contingency. contingently. This relationship established between God's freedom and contingency asserted by Duns Scotus is clearly maintained in Pannenberg's own theology. The task of reclaiming contingency involves in Pannenberg's view also to understand the history of the abolition of contingency in the mechanistic theories of the scientists in the 18th and 19th century and to analyze the philosophical and theological presuppositions of such views. In the way Pannenberg tells the story in a variety of his writings, Descartes is, for the best of theological intentions, the main culprit. Descartes' book Le Monde, written around 1630, but only published in 1664 after his death, because he feared the inquisition in the nervous atmosphere after the second trial of Galileo, is Pannenberg's main piece of evidence for this view. In Pannenberg's interpretation, the crucial step in Descartes' work is the formulation of the principle of inertia. Everybody, every part of matter, stays in the state in which it is unless it is moved from without. On the basis of this principle, all changes in the state of material bodies in the world can be ascribed to the mutual interaction of material bodies. Recourse to God is no longer necessary for interpreting particular events, only for creating bodies, the principle of inertia, and conserving them in existence. Since in Descartes' view, bodies are in motion from the beginning, God's, God creates a chaos and not an ordered static structure, and have an intrinsic tendency to continue this movement on a straight trajectory. Any deviation from this straight path is caused by the interaction of bodies with one another. The non-intervention, even the non-involvement of God implied in this view, can be justified theologically by the immutability of God. The principle of inertia replaced the Aristotelian notion that everybody naturally tends towards a state of rest 
so that every movement is caused by a mover different from whatever is moved. The principle of inertia applied to moving bodies in this way also destroys, as Pannenberg acutely observes, the foundation of Thomas Aquinas's first proof for the existence of God in the five ways, ex parte mortu. In Pannenberg's interpretation, Spinoza completes the abolition of contingency by a deterministic network of natural causes, which is established in its, necess in its necessary order in God's action and is not open to divine intervention or interaction. For the philosophical retrieval of the notion of contingency, the controversy between Leibniz and Newton and Newton's apologist Samuel Clarke is for Pannenberg of special significance. Pannenberg rejects Leibniz's criticism that Newton's characterization of space as the sensorium dei, the sensory apparatus of God, turns God into a material being. He agrees with the interpretation of Newton's friend Samuel Clarke that the divine sensorium should not be seen as an organ of perception, but as the medium of the generation of all things. Just like a sen our sensory apparatus produces the, produces the images of things, so God produces through the mediation of space the things themselves. In Pannenberg's interpretation, limitless space must, in Newton's view, both be seen as an implication of God's immensity and as an effect of God, because it offers space for the creatures since it can be divided. The undivided and infinite space, God's immensity, is thus in Pannenberg's interpretation of Newton the presupposition of all divided geometrical spaces and as such the medium of God's presence with his creatures without compromising God's transcendence. Pannenberg has a similar argument, this time developed on the basis of Plotinus's reflection on eternity, for God's eternity as the undivided totality of time, functioning as the presupposition of all notions of periods of times and their succession. Space and time are, in Pannenberg's interpretation of Newton's, and Plotinus' view, modes of God's presence in creation. With this interpretation, which is for Pannenberg not only a matter of historical reconstruction, but of using the historical debates as a means for establishing systematic possibilities, Pannenberg has secured a metaphysical interpretation of Newton's concept of space, which he claims remains valid in spite of the criticism of modern physics of Newton's understanding of absolute space. Similarly, he claims that Plotinus' understanding of eternity as the ground of the possibility of all structured times, the understanding of the duration of time and of location in time, still is the most elaborate, most developed, the most sophisticated understanding of the relationship of time and eternity in Western philosophy. Both concepts of time and space find their proper relationship in the interpretation of the spirit as a field of force through which God is present to his creatures. Third section, the spirit as a field of force. Pannenberg's interpretation of the spirit, for which he always refers to John 4.24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth is without doubt the most innovative, but also the most daring proposal he has introduced into theology, not only to the theology of nature, but most of all into the doctrine of God. It is also the one which Pannenberg employs in order to tackle what he sees as the most serious problem of the mechanistic interpretation of the processes of nature. If all effects of force are caused by material bodies and their interaction, there is no room for God in the processes of nature. God is politely asked to leave the world of nature. For Pannenberg, a constructive way out of this situation is to appropriate the concept of fields of force as it was developed by Michael Faraday and to apply it to the understanding of the spirit in biblical traditions. Theologically, Pannenberg deviates from the interpretation of John 4.24 and the theological tradition since origin, 
who interpreted for the first time the spirit in the sense of the nous, the immaterial rational principle. Against such a view, Panbax points to the connection between field of force and the stoic notion of numa, spirit, that Max Yama had hinted at. The stoic notion of the pneuma as the all-pervasive air, which by its own tension, the Greek word is tonos, like in muscle tone, holds the cosmos together. This is for Pannenberg very close to the Hebrew understanding of ruach as air, breath, and wind. There is for him also a good Trinitarian reason for keeping close to that Hebrew understanding if we understand the divine uziah as the field which is manifested in the persons of Father, Son, and Spirit. The person of the Spirit is not himself this field, but has to be understood as a singularity of the field of the divine Uzia. However, there is a close connection between the role of the Spirit as the mediator of communion within the Trinity and as the media of relationship between the Trinity and the created world. Applied to created reality, no longer um, applied to created reality, force no longer has to be understood as an effect of a body and its mass. Conversely, if we follow the intuitions of field theory, bodies are forms of appearance, manifestations of the field of force. If God is spirit, and if the spirit is to be understood as a field of force, how does that reintroduce God into the understanding of natural processes? from which he had been evicted in the 18th century. Pannenberg claims that in exactly the same way as he has, has interpreted the relationship of God to space and time. Just as God's undivided immensity is the condition for the existence of created spaces and the way in which God in virtue of this constitutive relationship is present in every created space and also in their interrelationship. And just as God's eternity, as the undivided totality of all time, is the ground of the possibility of all times and of the connection between different points in time and periods of time, so God's omnipotence as the field of force of the spirit is the condition for any created transmission of force and the medium within which they occur. From this concept of the spirit as the field of force, which is the ground of the possibility of all created action and reaction, and the condition for the interaction of God with and in the created agency, Pannenberg interprets in his systematic theology the relationship of God, space, and time. First, he reduces the concept of space to time as the simultaneity of different entities, events, and processes. Secondly, he interprets the relationship of God's eternity to time as one where the future is understood both as the horizon of the contingency of every new event and as the sphere of the unity of all that remains unfinished and incomplete in time. The operation of the spirit in creation as the anticipation of the future consummation of everything, as in Romans 8.23, is therefore precursor of the eschatological reality of everything. At first sight, there is a tension between theology's view of God's future as the origin of every event and the source of its possible perfection, and the way in which the natural sciences depict all processes as the beginning, as beginning in the past and passing into the future. For Pannenberg, however, these two views are not incompatible. Because in the realization of events which are originated from God's future, there is the gradual building up of persistent structures which, manifests God, which manifest God's faithfulness to his creation. From the future, the constancy of God's ways with his creation is continuously developed as the connectedness of events which make the knowledge of law-like regularities in the natural science as possible. In this view, the dynamic of the divine spirit must be thought of as connected with time and space. It is in the field of force of the spirit that the power of the spirit grants the creatures their own presence and duration in time and consolidates 
consolidates their simultaneity in space. From the perspective of the creature, its origin from the future of the spirit presents itself always as the past of realizations that have already occurred. The spirit, however, encounters every creature, Pannenberg claims, as its future, anew, in every moment, and so includes and integrates its past and present. Last section, in conversation with Walter Pannenberg. Pannenberg's theology of nature, which is part and parcel with his whole theological system, both in its diachronic development and in, in its synchronic systematic presentation, is an impressive achievement in contemporary theology. It presents the most sustained attempt by any systematic theologian of the 20th and 21st century so far to integrate the engagement with the natural sciences in the overall theological enterprise and to show the creativity with which theology can relate, often through uncovering, um, the uncovering of the basic concept and root metaphors of science to the theory formation in the sciences. I think Tom Torrance is the only possible competitor that Pannenberg has in this field. Its ethos in maintaining the unity of reality as God's creation against the tendency to relegate theology to a special realm outside the interaction with the other spheres of human knowledge is just as impressive as Pannenberg's insistence on the unity of truth in the face of all temptations, either to suspend the question of truth altogether um, or to separate the truth of faith from what we hold to be true in all other spheres of life. Pannenberg's aim of achieving a consonance between our attempts at clarifying the intellectus fidei, the understanding of faith, and the intellectus scientiae, the understanding of science, is to be applauded without reservation. Against the background of this appreciation of this immense achievement, I would like to raise three questions which occur to me in reflecting on Pannenberg's achievement. The first is in, in search of a new paradigm. Pannenberg formulates his theological reflections within the paradigm of classical physics. Within this paradigm, we can describe the interaction of deaf and mute entities, force, mass, and impulse. The reason for this seems to be that for historical reason, Pannenberg goes back to the point where Descartes' law of inertia forms the foundation of the eviction of God and God's action from the process of, of nature. Pannenberg challenges the philosophical presuppositions of classical mechanics by his interpretation of contingency, his redefinition of the concepts of space and time as grounded in God's immensity and God's eternity, and offers a novel interpretation for the being and interpretation of the spirit by developing a philosophical interpretation of Faraday's understanding of a field of force. While this way of proceeding can be justified as an attempt of going back to the point where the problem started and by unraveling the knot of presupposition that leads to the exclusion of God from nature, one could also ask the more radical question, do we have to go forward to another paradigm in search of a more appropriate conceptuality to reflect on God's action in relation to nature? My suggestion is that the paradigm of communication offers a more promising way of reflecting on the relationship between theology and the natural sciences. Pannenberg's initial theological program was offered as a counterproposal to the theologies of the word, dominating the theological scene in various forms in German-speaking theology for much of the time of the 20th century. In Pannenberg's view, Revelation occurs indirectly through God's action in history. And he writes, the word relates to revelation as prophecy, as guidance, and as report. The word always comes second in Pannenberg. This contrast of understanding um, God's relationship to creation in terms of historical agency, instead of God's communication by the divine word, is maintained even in Pannenberg's systematic theology is the contrast between God's action in history and God's word a valid contrast? 
If we follow Pannenberg's own theological method by looking first at the biblical witnesses, we find that God's action and God's speaking are in most biblical traditions not viewed as an alternative. God's word is understood as God's efficacious word, as God's speech act, and by means, by means of which God creates being and meaning. Similarly, God's agency is understood as God's communicative action, communicating communion by establishing a communicative relationship with God's creation. It is because God's relationship to the world in creation, reconciliation and consummation is always a communicative relationship that the whole of creation responds to God's address by praising the creator. When we go back in the history of theology and science, again following Pannenberg's example of retrieving the often submerged history of concepts for describing our relationship to God in the world, we find that the world of nature from patristic times onward is understood as a book that is to be read for Christians by the guidance of scripture. This is not, at least not primarily, a paradigm of causality but a hermeneutic paradigm. The world is understood as a semiotic system in which we try to read in order to understand the address of God to God's creatures. What is the difference of the hermeneutic paradigm of reading from the causal paradigm of searching for relationships between causes and effects? <coughs> Again, it is the early modern period that provides the most interesting examples. <coughs> causal relationships do not convey meaning. Once the fourfold scheme of causes is reduced to efficient causality, we have only the relationship between event A and the subsequent event B, whatever they mean. The outcome of this is most clearly seen in Kant's theory of experience. Our senses present us with a puzzling pluriformity of the sense impressions which remain meaningless unless perceptions and concepts are brought together in the synthetic acts of experience. The divorce of being and meaning in the paradigm of causality is perhaps the greatest obstacle for a theological interpretation of nature in conversation with the sciences. Being is devoid of meaning unless we creatively invested with meaning. Not so in the hermeneutic paradigm of reading in the book of nature. Whatever has being has meaning in virtue of an author who invests everything that he creates with meaning. By reading the book of nature, we do not create meaning, but discover the meaning the creator, creator invested in creation from the beginning. Is this just an obsolete way, obsolete way of regarding nature that led to such imaginative or fanciful ways of discovering meaning as the Kabbalah and astrology? Is not the parting of astrology and astronomy, which for people like Melanchthon and Kepler still belong together, a sure sign of the victory of the causal paradigm over the hermeneutic paradigm? If we look at the development of the natural sciences in the 20th century, we can detect an increasing turn forward from a mechanistic paradigm to the paradigm of communication. The discovery that processes of encoding and decoding form part of the basic structures of life, for example, in our immune system. And then the deciphering of human DNA, which has developed into a deep reading of the encoding and decoding in proteins, has offered many examples of the fruitless, fruitfulness of working with the old and new paradigm of communication. Could it not be that large areas that were formerly analyzed exclusively in terms of causal, causal relations are also open to being investigated as processes of information processing so that meaning structures have causal effects? Because perhaps also on the micro level of quantum mechanics and the macro level of cosmic evolution. How to do things with words seems to be the maxim that can go through many variations in this paradigm shift. How to effect events and processes through information. How to create being from meaning are just two that immediately come to mind. 
The paradigm of communication has a long history, beginning with the biblical witnesses and continuing for a long time before and after the mechanistic era, which now appears as something of an interlude. Especially Reformation theology offers many striking examples of this way of understanding reality. Thus, the sun, the moon, the heaven, the earth, Peter, Paul, I and you, we are all words of God. Vocabula Dei, Martin Luther says in his exposition of Genesis. And he expands on that in the same lecture series by saying, every bird and fish are nothing else than words of the divine grammar. Would it be a promising course to follow Luther's idea of creation as a divine speech act that presupposes his understanding of the Trinity as eternal conversation, in which the Father represents the grammar, the Son, the dialectics, and the Spirit, the rhetoric of God's conversation within the Trinity, and of the Trinity with a created world of words that have being? Could the complex sounds of the semiotic processes of nature be understood theologically as resonances of the divine conversation? Finally, would one find new consonances between theology and the natural sciences in listening and responding to such resonances? Second question, from synthetic to polyphonic consonants. Pannenberg's theology of nature is focused on the problem how the law-like regularities of nature can be understood in such a sense that they are compatible with, with God's action in history both in particular events and in the final self-revelation of God at the end of history, of the history of natural processes, as it is proleptically disclosed in the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Explicitly, theological concepts like God's immensity and God's eternity provide the framework of possibility in which spaces and times can be understood as forming a unity. For Pannenberg, the theological perspective always presents the anticipation of the totality of being and meaning, which can only be fully disclosed at the end of history. In a way, the understanding of God provides both the ground of the possibility of all worldly events in their contingent particularity and their emergent connectedness, and the final horizon in which everything is disclosed in its two relations. In Pannenberg's view, theology always offers the synthesis in which everything hangs together. However, for Pannenberg, everything is based on the common plane to which both theology and the natural sciences relate the relationship between contingency and law-like uniformity. The question I would like to raise in conversation with Wolfhard Pannenberg would be whether a polydimensional understanding of reality would not be more appropriate for the conversations of theology with the natural sciences. Such a polydimensional understanding would comprise at least the dimensions of the physical, the chemical, the biological, the psychological, the personal, the socio social historical, the cosmological, and the theological dimension of reality. Each of these dimensions presents each of these created dimensions, present their own order of becoming, their relatedness to the other dimension, and their own particular modes of communication. For Christian faith, God is not only the ultimate framework for understanding the different dimensions in their interrelatedness, but it also claims that this ultimate dimension is disclosed in the dimension of historical and social reality with its physical, chemical, biological, psychological, and personal presuppositions. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The specifically Christian claim is that the creative and communicative reality is disclosed and becomes accessible in the dimensions of a bodily, historical, and social life. This reality, the eternal creative logos who communicates by created historical and bodily means, which is the sanctification of human created means of um, communication, is appropriated to us through the operation of God's spirit. Does this have implications for the way Christian theology conducts the dialogue with the natural sciences? 
the polydimensional character of reality and the way the triune God is both the ultimate framework and the experiential access to the understanding of reality would seem to suggest that the conversation with the natural sciences could be conducted as a conversation with particular sciences without striving in each conversation for the grand synthesis. And if the very being of God is a conversation, what better way would there be than being in conversation with particular conversation partners in the sciences? Pannenberg attempts to demonstrate the compatibilities of scientific theories and theological reflection in the overarching synthesis. Would we not have to start in our conversations from a lower level and look at the way in which the phenomena are given for scientific investigation and for theological reflection and what they have to say to us when we assume that in the end the phenomena are really legomena of the divine conversation with the created world as it is rooted in the conversation that God is. Last section. In the end, the beginning, or in the beginning, the end. A third point in the conversation with Pannenberg would have to be his fundamental view that theology looks at all events in the world from the perspective of the end of history, of the end of history of nature, whereas the sciences proceed by telling the story of the polydimensional becoming of the world from its very beginnings. Is this the alternative? Theology tries to understand the beginning from the end, and the sciences attempt to understand the end from the beginning. It seems that Christian faith as faith in the triune God cannot rest content with this alternative. Is it not committed to the view that if creation is the act of the triune God, then it is from the beginning aimed at bringing about the communion of God with his reconciled and perfected creation through a history? It is this end, the end of this beginning, that is anticipated in the operation of the Holy Spirit. What could be gained for the dialogue with the natural sciences if God's relationship to time is conceived in a consistently Trinitarian mood, in which God is both eternally present to every event in created time as the creative ground of his possibility and actuality, and eternally, temporally present to every event in created time and space, and perfectingly present as the consummation of all time in God's eternity, um, eternity i.e. as the anticipation of the future fulfillment of everything that is created. My suggestion to Wolfhard Pannenberg would be that only a consistently Trinitarian view of the relationship of the eternal God to time, of, to, of the eternal God to the times of creation, can offer a framework in which God's eternity is the ground of the possibility, the actual fulfillment that is hoped for, and the ultimate co-present meaning of each moment, reconciling its past and its future in the times and spaces of creation and in the processes of created becoming. On such a view, protology and eschatology cannot be played off against one another. Would this change our view theologically and perhaps also scientifically of how contingency and the law-like uniformities in the processes of nature have to be seen? With this question, the conversation has returned to the initial question with which Pannenberg started his attempt to explore the consonance between Christian theology and the natural sciences. Thank you for your patience. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, as with yesterday, we have grad fellows uh, running mics. Raise your hand, and uh, I will call on you. And I will um, start the question. Um, Early on in your lecture, I, mean, I want to just ask a question and make sure that um, I understood you correctly. And if so, I'd love you, for you to elaborate. One of the issues that's come in discussion is this idea of divine intervention or non-interventionism. Did I hear you correctly early on in suggesting that the issue of interventionism is uh, derivative or dependent on the idea of the principle of inertia? 
And if I'm correct on that, uh, would you please elaborate on that for us? Uh, that certainly is Pannenberg's view, and one has to say in that view he's right. Divine intervention becomes the main issue in the discussions after Descartes. Once the mechanistic um, worldview was established and um, the regularities of nature could be um, explained by necessary natural laws, then suddenly intervention becomes um, the point of discussion. And I think Pannenberg is concerned, as many theologians in the 19th century already were, to get away from this focus on divine intervention, which makes miracles as a violation of the laws of nature, Hume's definition, which I think is nonsensical. I mean, you can violate a, a, a legal uh, law, but how do you violate a, a, a law of nature? I mean, that's not automatically clear what Hume means here. Uh, became the paradigm for discussing divine action. And Panamak's view in this, I think, is to one extent um, similar to that uh, which we find, say, in the Laxmandai school at the end of the 19th, 19th century, um, where these Anglican theologians argued that um, a god who is only an occasional visitor at certain times of intervention is for the most time absent from the world. Panberg wants to make sure that God is both present at all times, but can also act in contingent acts uh, of history. And the field theory, for example, tries to unite these two emphases. As you will have heard, I, th I still think that this is not the solution, but only a step towards the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Hector? Thank you for a learned, endlessly smart paper. Um, so there's something that puzzles me, and it, it carries on some topics from yesterday, but you brought it up today as well. Um, you claim, following Pannenberg, that um, only a freely acting cause can create something contingent, and it's not clear to me why that's so. Um, so it might be a bad theological sentence, but I think it's a good, theological, or a good logical sentence to say, God necessarily creates free creatures which is to say, God necessarily creates creatures whose lives are not governed by necessity. So it seems to me that you can decouple the necessity of origins from necessity governing that which has been created. And it's also, just to follow up on something you said yesterday, um, only a triune God can so freely act. But I wonder about some of the Gnostic pictures of the creator as a kind of <coughs> arbitrary wanton, right? You could think of, or Hume actually brings up this point, um, you could think of a creator as just wantonly creating all kinds of universes, one of which happens to be ours, and this one may happen to be good, but it's not due to any necessity on the part of the creator, right? So it's not clear to me why even if we do need a freely acting creator, why that freely acting creator would <coughs> have to be triune. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's also an endlessly smart question. So I will only be, be able to, um, to give a, a very limited um, answer to that. Uh, you have to decide whether it's um, marginally smart. Um, the, the point, I think, is simply that um, Panamak wants to show that um, the understanding of contingency, uh, if you understand it in Aristotelian Thomist framework has to do um, with um, the principle that every agent acts according to his, her, its nature. If that is the case, that every act is, so to say, preformed by the nature, then um, an agent cannot uh, produce contingent effects that are entirely contrary to that nature. And the interesting move in Duns Scotus is basically that's the end of substance metaphysics there. Uh, where he says that everything, everything that is, is um, grounded in the free choice of God. Um, and then the question is, how is it that this choice can, so it seems, to create arbitrary, contradictory effects? And Dun Scotus' theory is, of course, that God conceives everything, the whole realm of possibility, all at once. And therefore, what successively appears in time um, is such a recognized in this intuition of the divine mind. Um, 
Um, the interesting point for that for Pannenberg is that um, in order to explain contingency, it would not be a good move to make your substance metaphysics too tight. And therefore, he refers to Scotus in saying, we need this kind of freedom. Now, if one interprets this sentence, God necessarily uh, creates free uh, um, creatures. The smart move is uh, to um, put the necessity into the adverb, and therefore by make it open for contextual definition. What is necessity in this sense, in Duns Scotus's view, it could only be the self-determination of God to create free creatures. And um, in that sense, God freely chooses um, free, to create free uh, creatures. Is there any kind of ne necessity in that? Well, certainly not the necessity of any other instance or agency that could make things necessary for God. The only necessity is his free choosing so that for God, freedom and necessity are one. And that would be the only level in the whole ontology where, where that's the case. Once the free creatures are there, um, they are destined to be free. There is a necessity uh, in which they cannot simply deny their freedom, although it is uh, although and because it is a created freedom. I think that would be the st uh, strategy. Now, is this act of divine self-determination the act of a single subject that chooses, so to say, its own future? Um, there, I think, the answer of Christian theology would be, and that's a classical answer, no, it isn't. And um, if you put, like, say, Bruce McCormack, election before the Trinity, you have exactly this model that the authority of God is chosen as the first means of self-determination. Now, if you think that the Trinity is really eternal, then God's freedom is always freedom all over against another. It's always um, relational freedom. And this relational freedom, I think, makes a difference to the way um, you relate God's freedom to the processes of nature um, and uh, to the action of subjects. You would avoid this kind of uh, insistence um, on an atheism for the sake of human freedom that you have in the 19th century if you're not putting God and humanity as two subjects against one another. A subject always has um, as its um, logical complement an object. A person has as its logical complement other persons because to speak of persons in the singular is nonsensical. Una persona is nulla, nulla persona um, that's a Latin rule I invented. <laughs> I think we've had enough smart questions for one section. So we have about a 10-minute break. Uh, please be back in the room at 9.50.